Hello everybody, my name is Libby Gore and I am delighted to welcome you to this conversation with Peter Wilson. I acknowledge that we're on Indigenous land and pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. And how exciting that I can introduce you to Peter Wilson. Peter Wilson is Australian puppetry royalty. He works in the field of puppetry for the stage, for large scale events, for the community, in education at tertiary institutions, Puppetry based visual theatre and puppetry in large scale events is an extraordinary part of the world of entertainment that has emerged as an artistic phenomenon over the last 25 years. Peter is part of that world. He works as a director, producer, writer, educator, and puppeteer. I'm going to now read a list of your achievements, Peter, because <laughs> I think that everybody needs to know on paper what you've done. All the awards that Peter's won, including the Canberra Times Artist of the Year Award. What year? Uh, 95. Yes, correct. The Sydney Meyer Individual Performing Artist of the Year Award in 97. 97. <laughs> the Australia Council Individual Development Grant 93 and 99. The Australia Council Fellowship in 2002. Senior Creative Fellow, the Victorian Arts Centre, 2002-2003. He's had Asia Link residencies, Japan in 2002, Bali 2010, and a Unima Australia Award in recognition of contribution to puppetry 2008, Dragon Child 2011 from the China National Ministry of Culture Awards. Goes on and on. Best theatre <laughs> production, best music score, best and best actress. Oh, that must have been one of those drag shows. Okay, got it. <laughs> The Helpman Award, Outstanding Theatrical Achievement for the Design, Creation and Operation of King Kong. The Creature, I remember that, 2013. That was huge. Huge. Six metres, in fact. The Australian Arts in Asia Award. Is it Cho Cho? Yes. Best Theatre, 2013. That's how right. Do, how does it make you feel for me to read all of those out? Well, one doesn't achieve all of that without an incredible team behind you. So I guess I'm... A, a fortunate recipient of those awards and it, it, it's incredible as you've listed them I've never sat down and gone you know awards are not that important necessarily um, so teams are supporting creating those kind of awards and it's fantastic with the amount of artists that I've worked with over the last 45 plus years 45 plus yeah so yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's exciting and phenomenal and it kind of puts you into a point where you go, am I that old? Oh, <laughs> never. <laughs> never old enough. No, no, not with the creative heart. Tell me, how did you get into puppetry? I mean, what inspired you about the art form to set you up for this very long journey? I grew up in Perth. It was a really kind of quiet, small city way back in the 50s, 60s. And I was, it was such a freeing place to grow up. Education-wise, it was incredible. There was a um, lot of safety about walking to school. Uh, there was never any concerns about, you know, these days your mum takes the kid to school. And in those days, we used to walk a kilometre um, and used to dawdle along the street. And I used to talk to the ants. And I, I, I was just a kind of free. Free range. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of imagination as a kid as well because there was no television and we created and played and I remember I used to create and play in the back garden and, and dig holes and talk to trees and plants and, and I always sensed that there was a spirit within all of that kind of stuff. And I was about five or six years of age and my mother said, I want to take you to a puppet show. Ah. And... You may recall the Tintukis. They go right back to uh, the 50s, 60s and 70s. A really wonderful puppet director, puppeteer, a guy called Peter Scriven, created the Tintukis, right. um, telling lots of Indigenous stories. And so at five or six years of age, my mother took me to the Playhouse in Perth, in Pier Street. And I saw my first string puppet show and was ca so captivated and I recall crying and thinking this is beautiful and wonderful and then two years later my mother took me again when the company was touring to Perth and and so I had already I guess ignited some kind of imagination and flame in the background 
and it was, you know, school developed and moved on, and I, um, I was always interested in theatre. I trained as a dancer through l later in high school years, and then I worked and trained as an accountant, and went off and did classes. And my mother sang in a choir, and we went to the theatre all the time. So that was kind of the theatrical world was embedded. But and why puppets? Why puppets? The answer to that probably comes a wee bit later. Because when I moved from Perth to Melbourne, um, I no longer wanted to be an accountant, which was what I studied. Um, Dad said, get a career, son, a proper career. Yeah. You know, our parents always said that to us. So I Something to fall back on. Something to fall back on, a real job. Yeah. You've heard that before. Yeah. So I took up the um, training and got an accountancy degree and uh, and then I worked for a couple of years and I recall in a couple of companies in Perth I thought, you know what, I don't want this as a career. And at that time my girlfriend and I decided that we would leave Perth and we drove across the Nullarbor, came to Melbourne and I made a decision never ever to be an accountant ever again. And I walked into the CES, the Commonwealth Employment Service, and I kind of cruised the board and thought, what, uh, what work is available? And there was a little sign that said, Papa Chia wanted. Oh. Unbelievable. And I went, I think I know what that might be about. Anyway, I went home and picked up the landline mm. <laughs> and made the call and... The guy whose company it was was a gentleman called Parry Marshall, and he invited me to his uh, studios in Camberwell. And that, in a way, was the beginning of me falling into the art form and having a career that still continues to today. Tell me about that studio in Camberwell. What did you see? What, do you remember walking into a brand new life? Did you have a sense, this excites me, you see, this story? Because... Sometimes you can walk through a door and no life changes. Well, it, it actually, you're absolutely right about changing my life. I was excited about the, the characters, the creatures. Um, I'd never seen a Punch and Judy show. Oh, really? The, the director of the company, Parry, had been a, you know, was a pom. He'd come out and moved to Melbourne. He'd brought the puppet show out. <clears throat> And he employed puppeteers and makers throughout the community and had joined his company. And I met like-minded fellow travellers mm. who through to today are still very good friends um, through that company. And he told the Punch and Judy stories and we had fun. I worked with that company for two years. What did you do? What did you do? Well, crazy Punch and Judy stories. We travelled to schools. You do, you know, three shows a day. Um, there was Punch and there was Mrs Judy and... Judy would have the rolling pin and always hit Mr. Punch over the head. And there was Toby the dog and Toby, Mr. Punch would put Toby through the washing machine and he'd come out flat. Oh, gosh. You know, those washing machines in those days were those ones where you put your sheets through. Yeah. And so Punch would put the dog through. Oh, gosh, it's so, so unsound for... Terrible, <laughs> terrible politics at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was such fun. And halfway through, two-thirds of the way through that process... Um, a job had come up in a theatre restaurant, um, a restaurant called Anatole's in Kew. And so the, the buddies that were still working with Parry, we had gone off and were developing on the side this production of Hansel and Gretel for this company. And it opened. Parry found out that we were all, you know, working on the side and... That was the end of our time with his company. And that was the beginning of the foundation of Handspan Theatre. Ah, which of course has been such an important part of your life. But did you get any formal training? Like, did you choose to go and train with master? I mean, how does one become an expert in the theory of puppetry even? Look, it, it is one of the, 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 it's, I think, one of the most important areas of any art form is the training. And what I discovered early on was that there was a distinct lack of training in Australia. Right. And that led me to, um, particularly within Handspan, we were working for a couple of years before I 
decided that I required some training. Right. I mean, back in Perth, I'd been training as a dancer. Um, I trained as an accountant. Um, in the arts, generally, people train. Dancers train, drama, students train, opera singers train. Why don't we train puppeteers? And so I applied for a position with the Tasmanian Puppet Theatre. And they had a reputation, and they'd been running for a number of years. Nigel Triffitt, who you know, uh, was working down the company at that time. Yeah. And so I went, I was accepted into the company, went down and worked with them for um, about 15 months and worked with international teachers who, at the time, Lyndon Peter Wilson had been inviting puppeteers and puppet uh, teachers and um, senior artists across from Europe to his company. That was the reason why I went, because I wanted to learn more. So I came back from Tasmania and was able to implement some of that stuff within Handspan. And Handspan was, just so that everybody understands, your vision for Handspan? Uh, was to... We were a bunch of hippies. Ah. We're talking 1977. Right. We were a bunch of artists who wanted to expand and develop and take puppet theatre in any direction possible. But you, it was... It was sort of social comment too, like, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. With puppetry. So you could talk to young people through the platform because it's a cute young platform, puppets. And use it politically. And use it for... Ooh, you cheeky. We did a lot of that stuff, you if you did. remember, in the late 70s and... I watched it. Early 80s. Yeah. Uh, and so that, there was... I mean, it was a really fantastic company. You know, the, there was Ken Evans and Helen Rickards and Maeve Vella and and Christine Woodcock and Phil Lethleen and Andrew Hanson, these people, some of them you would remember. Um, we are still all friends. Everybody still was together. But the puppets weren't like sock puppets, Punch and Judy caricature puppets, were they? They were different puppets. We started to develop, correct, we were using rod puppets. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the political comment was just large-scale, big object, characters, creatures, st stuff out in the street, politicising whatever the the fight was at the time against the government. But we, we, we just continue to um, develop work, but, tr but the whole aspect about training or the lack of it was really, really critical. And I began, as we developed work through the early part of the, the 80s, um, and hands back, we were, we were breaking, we wanted to break rules, you know, animate the inanimate, um, which was part of our philosophy. Anything can be a puppet. Mm. That was part of the very first thinking of, of how we wanted to express ourselves through telling, telling any kind of story through puppetry. And so that training, I continued to see that there was a distinct lack of training which led me to apply to take up a course with Philippe Jonti. Who's like world famous puppeteer. Exactly. And so I wrote to Philippe and he was doing his first stage workshop with um, at the, the, the major puppetry institute in charleville Messier, And it was the first time that that school had opened and I applied and so did a friend, Michelle, uh, here. And 12 students from around the world were accepted into oh, that wow. course. And uh, Shelley and I were two of them. You've got to be bold, don't you? You've actually got to be brave and think outside the square to create something new sometimes. I mean, you really do have to search it out. Yes. And then take a punt, have a crack. I, I, I didn't know whether I would be accepted at that course. No. <clears throat> one of the things that they were after, in fact, was you needed to have French. Mais oui. Mais oui. Bonjour. Comment? And, right. So I ended up taking, um, I remember actually in high school, first year high school, 13, one of the subjects was French and I remember thinking, why do I need this language? And, of course, there am I, 24 years of age, thinking, why didn't I continue to study French? <laughs> because now I've been accepted into a course at the, at the preeminent puppetry institute in France mm. and I needed French as a... So I worked hard and was accepted into that program. Can I ask you about the role of puppetry in France? The fact that he did have a, an institution in France where it was respected as an art form, did you find that in Europe... Obviously, culturally, puppetry had a much more cemented place in storytelling than it did in little old young Australia. Exactly. It's, 
it's actually it's uh, deeply embedded in in society and in culture right through Europe. The uh, um, you look at the history. I'm particularly interested in the history of how puppetry developed. And I'll give you an example where I've just talked about Punch and Judy. Punch and Judy was a, were what were created um, in around the 1650s in in UK in Britain. Mm. But that character, Mr. Punch, moved through Europe. So you've heard of Pun- uh, Pallacanello, you've heard of Casper. Casper's the German equivalent. Okay. And, and Guignol, Guignol, the French character. Punch moved all the way through, but he became a puppet character through all these places. And what was he there for? What was the role of Punch? A commentator on, on the, the politics and the society at that time. And what was Judy? <laughs> She was a commentator on Punch. Yeah, more or less a commentator on Punch, and um, I mean the, the politics of those two. The domestic, yeah, there were domestic TV issues in there, and there was a bit of violence. Yeah, and I, you know, we were talking when I was doing those stories 40, 40 years ago. It was of its time. It was of its time. It was of its time, and and in fact, when Punch was created in the sixteen hundred and fifties, and Judy came along about 20, 30 years later as a as a kind of a a playoff against Mr. Punch, and then the animal characters came into his story. But he was really commentating on the world and society. And, and in fact, one of the things that used to happen in that part of the world, politics was the politics that was going on in the, the appropriate relevant countries. A puppeteer would be up there telling the story. It was the puppet telling it, not the actor. Right. And they could pick up their boots and run when they heard that um, the law was coming to stop the, right. the, the commentary that was going on in the city square. Just pick up their stuff and go. And, and run and disappear and hide in somebody's house. So Gave you a disguise. Yeah. So, so training with, so going to an institute where puppetry is really embedded within society, um, and there's a lot of puppet companies over there, you know, even in Russia, there's some incredible schools of training in Russia, massive school um, in Moscow, and one of the, the greatest um, puppet teachers was a Russian man, Sergio Abrazov, mm-hmm. um, amazing puppeteer. And a lot of us kind of used him as a, as a model to, to our name, our careers at. Uh, Germany had some incredible puppeteers and Philippe was renowned. He had already come to Australia. He taught in Australia. He had... You would have seen his productions through the 80s and I'm 90s. Sure I did. I met Philippe in 1978 in Hans Ban Studios. Right. A year after we had formed, and he was performing at the Comedy Theatre. And I became friends with him, and still we're dear friends. He's now 82. Oh, um, la la. La la, yeah. He's a, he's a very, very dear friend. And his wife, Mary, who used to do all the choreography. Mm. Really important. Uh, really important people in a lot of. Um, puppeteers' developments, lives, um, but I, I, he's you know he's one of my mentors, which is really interesting, obviously, because I mean the French are so much more overtly politically engaged than we Australians have been to date, barring a yes. couple of significant election campaigns. Yes, thinking in particular about 1972 with Gough Whitlam, and I'm interested in that Handspan came out in 1977 which was Malcolm Fraser's time after the Whitlam dismissal. So it was, and Don Dunstan's time in South Australia, Correct. actually. So you actually emerged at a time of great progression and uh, engagement in politics in Australia. So the arts were just, South Australian Film Corporation was starting. That's so you right. were part of that whole push. Well, Circus Oz also formed yes, you said. the year after us in 78. Um, they were about six or nine months after Handspan formed. Our identity. And then not long after that was Ant Hill. Yeah. Uh, so La Mama? And La Mama. La Mama prior to us. Okay. La Mama in the early, late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, Pram? Mr. Pram Factory? The Pram Factory. Uh, the Pram Factory, exactly. Uh, and A cultural awakening. David Williamson, it's all that time arts is politics. Exactly. And, of course, through the Australia Council between... 72 and 75 during Gough Whitlam's time was when the Australia Council was created. Actually, Gordon had begun the idea of the Australia Council, but it got implemented fully by Gough Whitlam in 1972. 
And so that gave more opportunity for artists to actually start to apply, get money and... and Use their own voice. Exactly. So tell me about uh, Skylark. What's Skylark? And in particular, inside dry water, given that Glen Ira, who we speak with today on behalf of, they had a very strong relationship with the Boyd family who had that place down in Murrumbina Road that I used to go past every day for school. Well, let, let me tell you about Skylark. I'd love to know about Skylark. The, a couple of, uh, they were formed in the mid-80s. Mm. What is it? The, uh, they were a puppet theatre company okay. based in Canberra. Ah. And they had formed in about 84, 85. Uh, so seven, about seven or eight years after Handsman had formed, and a couple of friends had started the company, and I got to know these friends really well, and they often invited me up to come and look at their work in Canberra. And then in about um, 92, 92, 93, the company had come to me and asked me, would I be interested in going on their board? Ah. So... And, pollination. And, and that led out of, I'll, I'll just add a little thing here is, so after, after me studying with Philippe Jonti, if I may, I came back to Melbourne and I was invited to two master classes in Hobart to teach, ironically, having gone down to Hobart 10 years earlier mm. to learn. There is me teaching back with Terrapin, the puppet company down there. And I ran two puppet master classes in, um, in Hobart and then Skylark in the late 80s, early 90s, were looking for training. And so you start to see a link about the importance of, of good teaching and good training in the art form. Mm -hmm. So they invited me up to Canberra to run Skylark. And I changed the name from Skylark Puppet Theatre to Company Skylark. I was on the board for a year and through that process they asked me would I like to become the artistic director. Ah. And I said, no. I I've love got it. handspan. Uh, yeah, I love living in Melbourne. I've got handspan. So I sat on it for about a year. Um, and then they continued to ask me. And then I went, you know what? I, handspan was like a family and I felt I needed to make the shift, mm. um, having been with handspan for 16 years. Mm. So you can kind of get the sense that you want to break away from the family. but and see whether you have the capabilities of making work. So I went to um, I went to the board and said, I'd love to take on the role of artistic director. So they were doing kids' work. I was very interested in continuing the kids' work but opening up to more, more uh, mature subjects and adult, adult puppet theatre. And the Arthur Boyd piece became part of one of those works, right? which is the uh, Inside Dry Water story. And whilst I was uh, on the board, the company had commissioned a writer, Beatrix Christian, to do a script around the Arthur Boyd Bride series. And... Just so that we're not speaking amongst ourselves, yeah. of course, Arthur Boyd of the Boyd family were really important part of the Melbourne push into art. And I think that Sister Mary married Sidney Nolan and, you know, they were all doing amazing things. What the decades in the 60s? Uh, 50s and 60s? The Bright series was the 50s. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, they did pottery, they did clay, there was a whole heap of them. Yeah, 50s, 60s, incredible. And so I, when I was taken on as the artistic director, the story that B had written was exhilarating and wonderful and extraordinary. And, it, and it, it dealt with imagination and it dealt with the spirits of the land and it dealt with a kind of Punch and Judy man, bizarrely, yeah. who'd been written into this script, who at somehow ends up in the desert. And Beatrix had taken Arthur Boyd's Bride series and used that as an inspiration to tell this story. How amazing. And so in 94, when I took on becoming the artistic dire director of Company Skylar, I developed the work through that year. And in 1995, we opened the work at the National Festival of Australian Theatre for Robin Archer's Festival. Oh, wow. 
and it became this really incredible production that ended up having um, massive national touring and international touring. It was a puppet show with an adult story. Yeah, it, I mean, actually, Nigel Triffitt had been creating a couple of works. You may have seen Secrets. Um, you may have seen Mama's Little Horror Show yeah. at the Last Laugh Theatre restaurant, which was kind of adult, sort of early adult stuff. Philippe Jonti's work when he come, was coming to Australia in the late 70s. It was family work, but it was, was intelligent concepts and it was about imagination and it was about the other. Yeah. So it was dealing with really interesting ideas. And so Inside Dry Water developed it, made it, and in 1995, we did a season at the Parramatta Theatre and, and I wrote to Arthur Boyd asking him, he was aware that we were doing the production, and I invited him and Yvonne to come to see the show. Ooh. So he came to the opening night and we had created um, an exhibition of the whole Bride series um, and framed them all, um, did prints and framed all these images and so the foyer was an exhibition and it was, the press was there. Um, and when Arthur and Yvonne came in, there was, along the wall was that whole series. And it was really wonderful, mm. him observing that. And mm. the cameras captured his responses and reactions to that. He went into the theatre and sat down to watch Inside Dry Water, which was his work coming his to life, work coming the bride and the groom mm. coming to life on stage. In puppetry. In puppetry. And when the performance finished, the cast came out to uh, do a bow. The audience clapped and Arthur stood up and he did his own standing ovation to the cast. Oh. And the audience realised that... That was him. It was Arthur Boyd in the house. And ah. the whole audience went up and clapped him. Oh, God. It was one of those very extraordinary, wonderful moments that I will never forget. And... He was blown away by the work and in the lobby afterwards, and I walked uh, Arthur and Eve onto the car, he said to me, I want to create an, a different series so you can take that and turn that into a piece. Mm. That was one of the most incredibly affirming uh, responses and he never got round to that series. A couple of years later he passed. Um, but to have that endorsement... And that response. I'm so glad you put that story down in archive. I'm so glad we've told that story. I got shivers here in it's, that it's, story. It's, 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 a it's, it's a wonderful story. story. It's, it was he uh, just sitting there with them, and there was, I mean, there was, Arthur was there, and Yvonne was there, and and the producer of the theatre was there, and so he and I sat next to each other. And of course, I was nervous the and, whole time through. Yeah. And I had told the cast that he was coming, but of course the audience didn't know he was there. Right. And we'd, and we'd asked Arthur to come kind of late after a lot of the audience was in the house. And some of them probably recognised him coming to his seat. We plonked him in the house seat. And, but it was only at the end when he stood up to thank the cast. Did he look at you before he stood up? Or did he look at you while he was standing up? Look, I think probably both. I know. I know. After he was clapping, then he looked down at me and clapped. He, he did a clap to me, and I tell. I mean, there was tears. I have to say, I'm a um, <laughs> bit of a sook sometimes. So it's uh, nice. It, it's nice to be in the moment and feel it. I reckon. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. this is what's so interesting. So you've done this deeply artistic work and sensitive work and tested yourself and concepts, and then you've moved into the the kind of brash populism I would have to say of doing something like an Olympic Games opening ceremony in 2000 uh, that would have also been challenging another part of your creativity and brain to tell a story with puppets to a global audience through a screen and the fact that nobody in Australia no none of the creators had actually except for Rick Birch yeah Rich, Rick you would know was the Rick, creative Rick. director yeah he did LA he did the, all the pianos and, and David stuff. Atkins was also involved right exactly so Another Melbourne none Melbourne. of the creative directors had actually done anything on that scale before. So Meryl Tankard and Nigel Triffitt. And, With puppets. Uh, Richard Werrett and, and, and Nigel Jameson. These are all huge names. Huge, uh, huge, huge names. Huge names. And to be included in that list was 
really remarkable. To, to direct one of the six sections within the opening ceremony was uh, Lex Marinos. He, I know Lex. Um, it was a really phenomenal time. And so. What story did you tell in the opening ceremony? Rick and David, I was in Canberra at the time. I just uh, had finished doing a number of projects with Skylark. And uh, David rings me up and says, um, We might have a project up here in Sydney mm. that you're interested in. And we'd like you to come up and um, direct a section and put in a whole lot of puppetry into it. So when I got to Sydney, I went to a meeting and they asked me what I'd like to direct the nature section. Of the Olympic Games, of the Olympic opening. Games opening ceremony. And you, in your head, what did you do? You see on the wall there, there's an image that ah. comes from the nature section of uh, the Sydney 2000. And so over the next... 15 months, we developed the idea. Now, Australia, generally the Olympics are given about six to eight years ahead. And Australia had been developing it. And I was brought in in early 99 into the project mm. and worked on it through until we opened on, I think, the 15th of September 2000. It was a phenomenal process. Of, and I, all of us had to learn how to create this and make it. But, it, you know... Eamon Darcy, the beautiful Eamon Darcy, a really wonderful designer, was, um, I was asked by Rick and David two things. Who would you like to design and who would you like to compose? Here's five composers. Here's a three-minute track that you can have a listen to. Here's a couple of designers. And I immediately, I've worked with Eamon before and I said, Eamon's perfect, he'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I was given a number of composers and I chose Chong Lim, oh. um, beautiful composer. Yes, who of course. Works with uh, John Farnan and his own musical. Dancing director. with the Stars. Dancing with the Stars. All of those things. He's... And his piece, of, his music, was just a three-minute sample. And I went, "That's the one." And I, ne I knew of Chong, but I thought this this works perfect. And the work itself, I, um, you know, Chong being. Malaysian Australian, and I, I felt that he'd have the sensitivities to the work that I wanted to create. But when it's mentioned to you, oh, we're doing the Olympic Games, you want to play, what happens to your heart then when you hear that? When David Atkins rings, it's not like you're expecting that call, is it? No, <laughs> I was not expecting it because I thought the team had been created already. So, you know, I was getting on with life. There's two things happen. One is, oh, Oh, in the mind is, I've never done something like this. I can't do it. But don't say that, Peter. Just say, and just take a breath and say, what an incredible opportunity. I'd love to do it. Ah! And that was my response. Grace. And then I work out later how to do it. Yeah. Um, but you can't but say no. You can't say no. no. I think that's, that's, I think all artists, you would have found it yourself. Sometimes you've been asked to do things and you've gone, I don't know just don't even think that. Put that aside. It's those voices that we hear. And the voice that comes out is the voice that says, I'd love that. That's it, It's a remarkable opportunity and thank you for this incredible gift. I'd love to do it. And just sort of have faith that within your toolbox of skills, you'll work out which bits to pull out to make it work. Correct. And interestingly enough, everything is a stepping stone, isn't it? Because after doing the Olympic Games... You kind of think, oh, that's the pinnacle, but actually it opened more doors. You're absolutely right, Libby. It opened incredible. It took me, it took me on a journey actually over the next uh, probably 18 years to directing huge events all around the world. Really? Yeah. Um, I would have never thought that this might have turned into something that, you know, I do the Olympics and the Olympics are... Um, you know, incredible success. And uh, then a few years later, um, I'm asked to work on the Commonwealth Games here in Melbourne. Um, and then later that year, I was invited to uh, be a director on opening closing ceremony for the Doha Asia Games, oh, wow. working with David Atkins. Um, it's all about relationships, isn't it? It's about relationship. So when you set your vision for yourself after that, like, where am I going to go next? Is it it can't just be, it takes us back to the beginning of this conversation about, it's, it's, about solo versus team. You kind of want to move within a tribe. 
you, you, actually, the, the point you made about the vision and where to next, that's what happened at the end of the Olympics. Right. Because you thought, that on one sense, you felt that the world was going to open up and, and everything was possible. Mm. But what occurred, things for a lot of artists that worked on the Olympics quietened down a little bit in that next year. Right. And so I was in Canberra. And I sat down and thought, what's the next 10 years? What can I achieve now? Where to? After such a, a phenomenal experience and, you know, after every event and production and show, there's always a bit of a, a flat period. I wrote to the Victorian College of the Arts, to uh, Lindy Davies at the time and to Andrea Hull, who was the director of the Victorian College of the Arts. Um, and so the four ideas were to write a book to set up a, a tertiary education puppet program was to establish an, a national international puppet summit and to set up a new company. All of them by themselves were pretty significant. Mm. So the Arts Centre thought, wow, this is a really interesting idea. So I, they flew me down to Melbourne, stuck me in a hotel and invited me in to have a meeting. Um, and, and also I... At the same time in that, those two days that I was down in Melbourne, I had a meeting with VCA, with Andrea Hull and Lindy Davies. Because someone had to do this. And I said, somebody, and it was really interesting because um, I've always had a sense of shyness about me. I've never, you know, well, I think that's possibly one reason why you're always able to hide behind the puppet. Mm. And I've, perhaps I haven't valued what I've been able to contribute in the way when I reflect back, think, did I do that? So I was really feeling that somebody had to do this. And so the Arts Centre, I pitched all these ideas and said, is there a way that you see something happening and someone in Melbourne, these things occurring? And, and when I finished pitching the idea, I said, thank you so much and went to pick up my bag. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, thank you so much for listening to me. And they said, no, no, we, there's something we want to talk to you about. And they offered me a, a fellowship for 18 months to uh, um, realise the dream. So that someone was you? Me. <laughs> wow. And I went... What does that mean, a fellowship for 18 months? Does that mean coming home and being paid to be someone? Exactly. They brought me back down to Melbourne, um, put me up somewhere for a couple of months until I found here. Mm. Um, that was 20 years ago. Wow. 20 years ago. Actually. You didn't mind leaving Skylark? No, well, Skylark had, 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 had finally had run its course. course. Um, and I was looking for what the next journey was. And so it was a really, it was amazing. Um, it, it's a really funny thing. I, after they said, we want to offer you a fellowship, I didn't hear what they'd said. And I, so I went, again, went to pick my bag up and said, thank you so much. They said, did you hear what we just said to you? <laughs> and I went, what are you saying? We want to we wanna support you to realise your dream. How often does that happen? How often? Arts? And so I am ever indebted to, you know, there's Carillo Gantner and Tim Jacobs and a whole lot of staff in the Arts Centre that just were incredibly supportive the fellowship was actually for 12 months and they extended it to 18. So in that interim period, I was able to then develop the course at the VCA. They had agreed through the VCA we'd raised enough money to begin to um, write the curriculum. So the Arts Centre Fellowship paid for you to liaise with the VCA to create that course. How clever. What a clever setup, and what a great setup. And they... they House homed the National Puppet Summit wow. under Robin Archer's festival in 2002. So we had over 200 guests nationally, internationally. It was a massive, lots of incredible workshops and artists were coming and people were performing all over Australia and internationally, television personalities of, of puppetry. Yeah. It was a really phenomenal time. And, and so that was at the end of 2002. In the interim period, I'd actually gone to... Currency Press. In 2001, actually, I got on to Currency Press and said, look, I've got an idea. Um, I'm not really a writer. And I was quite shy about it. I went up to saw Catherine Brisbane 
you know, the wonderful Catherine Brisbane at Currency. And I was quite shy about the idea. I thought maybe who wants to write about puppetry? Who would produce a book on it? And when I wrote her a note, she said, come up, we love the idea. So I went up there, got talking to her, and she said, fantastic. I'd already written a shape to the book. In so she said, oh, that's someone who needs to do this book. But I then bumped into a friend down here in Melbourne. I'd come down here at the time, actually, bizarrely, to talk to the art centre. And I went to Malthouse, it was Playbox at the time, to yeah. see a show. And I bumped into Geoffrey Milne. Remember the beautiful Geoffrey Milne? Wonderful. Uh, he was a lecturer on dra in drama at La Trobe University. And um, I was chatting in the lobby uh, and I said, look, I'm a little bit shy to ask you, but I'm writing a book. I'm wondering if you could help me edit it. And his response was, I'd love to help write it with you. Oh, beautiful. And I went... So I went back to Currency and said, Jeffrey Milne is going to help write it and edit it. Yeah. He did a lot of the editing because I wasn't sure of the process. Hmm. I'm a puppeteer after all. <laughs> and so they just said, fantastic. And in 2004, through the fellowship and, and the next year, I completed the book and it was published in August 2004. I actually can't quite believe many of the stories that you're telling me in terms of the history of embedding puppetry into the cultural narrative, I guess of what is, we're a very young country in comparison with Europe. But interestingly enough, Peter's one of those people who have kicked us into being slightly more sophisticated about how we use the arts with communicating ideas, whether they be political or whether they be social or, or, or biographical indeed. Let's pick it up with Peter now. Everything you've told me, Peter, has come out of your brain. You've initiated your career. It's not like people have actually given you anything in terms of all the innovative stuff you've done. You've actually taken the lead in making it happen. When does an idea start to become possible? Mm. <laughs> what do you have to do to it in your head? Like it's there in your head. What's the process of making it become possible? Lots don't. Uh, no, but, but I, I think it's... it's it's an incredible um, observation you make because the, the, I think all things have possibilities. But it's actually being able to, to dimensionalise and see that it can become reality. That's how I then decide to pursue the idea. So how do you do that? I think it, then what do I do? Yeah, I mean, you, you think it, you... Let me give an example. At the moment, where I sit is coming out of COVID, having lost a number of productions. Mm, that must have been hard. It's been a challenge and most many friends have lost work and it's been a challenge for all of us. But, you know, I've kind of hung in there for a lot of it because in the background I've been developing some ideas and, and just lately I've been developing an idea for that may not go anywhere. But it's a way of, of just lubricating and stimulating my, my creative processes. And that's a, uh, a story about, in a way, the spiritual foundation of, of the underpinning of the Balinese culture by um, a Javanese, an Indian Javanese yogi. And so I've been researching the particular story of his and how his influences into Bali mm -hmm. came about. And I, it may not go anywhere, but I, I can smell and sniff that there's a possibility. So you do some work on it. And I've been writing stuff about it and I've written 12 scenes. Wow. Already. And this is just in the last week. So you write it down. I write it down. I put it down. And by putting it down, it no longer becomes kind of abstract and two-dimensional, you dimensionalise it, you give it a 3D. That's how I describe the way in which I make things happen, by taking it from a sentence on a page to, like, write a book, do a puppet course. Yeah, that's, that's all right. They're words, but how do you make that? How do you turn that in? So there's an action that's required to follow that. 
and that, that leads on to how, what's the creative process and, and what, what may be the end result. You, you kind of see what's at the other end, but the journey to get there. You need to write the steps down. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know what the, that next step is until you've completed the one before. That's right. So interestingly enough, I note you have a fascination with Asia and Eastern practices. Does that infiltrate, before I take you into a conversation about your work, say, across Asia, do you incorporate Eastern practices into your own mindset, into your own thinking? Um, I'm a, a practicing meditator. Um, I'm particularly interested in the Buddhist philosophy. Um, that's I've read a lot about the, that particular... Um, it's not a religion, it's a philosophy, the particular following of Buddha. So I'm interested in the, his teachings and teachings from the heart and, um, and, the way, and the way you seek the inner peace. And meditation has been a practice in my life for about 35 years. So I'm a wow. practicer of TM, Transcendental Meditation. How many minutes a day? Possibly 40. Really? When? Uh, in the mornings and in the afternoon. And that grounds you. It gives you kind of a real inner peace. And it allows you to kind of understand that, I mean, if something doesn't happen, not that's fine. You know, there's, you, you just, you don't attach yourself to it. You just let it go. I mean, that's part of the, the, the philosophy of Buddhism is don't attach. And therefore, the, nothing's really lost. Yes. So, but Asia has a very strong tradition of puppetry. Massive, You're totally, totally right. It's. <clears throat> I first went to Japan in 1979, and I fell in love with bunraku, which is a type of Japanese puppetry, mm -hmm. um, where three puppeteers work the one character. So in that 19, so 79 was the first trip, seeing bunraku, um, a traditional technique that was founded in around the 1600s. Um, I just sort of fell in love with this this technique. It was stunning. It was beautiful. The animation by three people working together, the energy of and the solid focus through every aspect about that puppet and bringing it alive and, and animating it to its fullest. It was beautiful, and I and I love the Japanese aesthetic. So that underpinned the beginning of um, a lot of my love for puppetry as well. Mm -hmm. So I. Over the years, I've spent a lot of time in uh, Asia, backwards and forwards to Japan. I've directed several works in Japan. Um, I've directed a number of works in China. Uh, the production that I did with Hands Band Theatre as a puppeteer and with Playbox as a puppeteer of yeah. Chocho in 84 and 87, I was invited to direct a production that was rewritten, Daniel Keane, you know Daniel Keane, a uh, Melbourne writer. Uh, he wrote the original uh, Chocho for Handspan. Right. We ended up, um, he ended up writing it and resetting it in Shanghai, set in the 1930s. Oh, beautiful. So I worked with the National Theatre of China, directed the work for them, hmm. created um, this really beautiful production. It played Sydney and Melbourne and did a tour throughout China. Uh, I worked with the China National Children's Theatre and did a production that toured the world for about eight years afterwards, um, many, many cities throughout the world. It was a really glorious production on um, the Zodiacs, uh, a lot of puppetry through it, a bit of dance. And I think in, in we talked earlier about the large scale project of the Olympics and, and Com Games and in 07, 08, 09, I was invited to Malaysia to direct a big government work, which was called Colours of Malaysia, huge big street procession work with four or 5,000 cast members with 100,000 people watching. And I made three works over three years, massive, hugely successful pieces with an Australian team and a, a Malaysian cast. These works were wonderful and such great fun and I loved living there and Malaysia is very much, it's, it's Malays, it's Indians and Chinese, so you get to immerse yourself within all of those cultures. And I received uh, a, an Asia link, and one of the Asia links was to Japan. Um, I was very fortunate to have a second Asia link that took me to uh, Bali. And so at the end of the Malaysia, 
I, I, there's one thing that I've kind of left out is, in 99, 2000, I developed um, with a number of artists, a co-Australia Balinese project. Uh, Nigel Jamieson was the director, Paul Grabowski, who you yeah. know, was the composer. Yeah. He was a Balinese composer. We went to Bali, we developed this work. Um, we met the puppeteer, who's a long-term friend of mine. I've now been working with him for the last 20 years. Um, he and I had an idea in after, so, so that work uh, was called The Theft of Sita. It was inspired by the Ramayana story. And it traveled Australia, it traveled international festivals over a period of three years. It played not long after 9-11. We went yeah. to New York three weeks after 9-11. We played at the Harvey Theatre as part of BAM, the Brooklyn Academy Music Festival. Um, huge success in, in New York. I stayed friends with Marty. Of course, he's a very darling friend and I would be backwards and forwards to Bali. And, and in 2010, early 2010, I was visiting him. No, 2009. And he said, come to Safari Park. And I went, what's there? Animals? Yes. He said, we're doing something, but there's a theatre that's been built here that the managers of the park weren't sure what to do with. If I, uh, it was a 1,200-seat theatre. Oh, wow. And I, Marty said, come and have a look. And then he set me up for a meeting with the, the producers of the park. And I went to meet them. But six hours before I went to meet him, I said to Marty, what story do you think we might do? By the time I met the producers, I'd written eight scenes. Wow. Just, just because I had a... I smelt that something was possible without even knowing what the park was. That production ran for 10 years oh. until COVID and has played to three quarters of a million people. See, this is where, interestingly enough, it brings us around to the beginning of the story because as a creative and a prolific creative and a self-driven creative, you've created all these works, but I bet you your accounting background has helped you actually with the business of the show and made you secure from your creativity? I'm so grateful to my father that he encouraged me to stay with the accounting because it has influenced all my work. Has um, it? From a financial... I've been able to run companies. Yep. I put all the budgets together. Yep. Um, I've been able to support colleagues. Um, when I was putting the budgets together, for example, for this big production in Bali, which was called Bali Agung, I, I semi-produced it right? and I put all the budgets together and all the Australian team, I managed and negotiated their fees and did the contracts for them, that they were happy. So I, would, I knew how to put the budget together for the uh, Indonesian producer. So you could look after yourself. Yeah. I've always, you know, it's been, it was, I've never regretted for, for one second about ever doing the the accountancy course that I did, getting that degree. It's fitted in. I mean, it's really interesting. I've always, you know, I'm, though I have to say I'm, I prefer the animation of figurines than figures. <laughs> Very nice. I got that in. <laughs> you did. Peter you know Wilson, that? I love it. Can I thank you for sharing your story? It's amazing. It's just a... You're a go-getter, a self-starter, and someone who's created their own life. Look, I, I've, I mean, yes, you, I think one does. Have, you're out there, you're trying to create, but I've had some incredible, along the way, I've had incredible support. Um, you know, with producers all over. I've, but you've also inspired people. Like, you've helped other people see what's possible through a medium that didn't have a pedigree in this country. So by being prepared to help other people tell their stories through a new platform, you know, you've built a tribe along the way. When, when I was, thank you for that, those thoughts, because I would, back to the training stuff, my great concern was the lack of training and part of that platform were four ideas. We ended up setting up a postgraduate course at BCA, which ran for six years. What's your legacy? And we had over 45 full-time students that went through there, but over 220 production students that were involved in all aspects of puppet theatre. And we brought to Australia 
Philippe Chanté came out and taught at the course. Ronnie Burkett came out and taught at the course. Petra Matasek, a Czech friend who's passed, came out and taught at the course. Eric Bass, a fantastic American puppeteer. They all came out to support me on the program. And I can't let this all end without asking you about King Kong. I mean, that was the latest huge, you know, puppet variable that happened in this country. It was. It, yes, you're right. It's, Do you call them puppets? I mean, yeah, they were. Yeah. It's, I mean, some people refer to them as animatronics, but Kong was just the, the biggest puppet ever created. He was six metres in height. Mm. Uh, the boys, the designers, had been working on him for three to four years before he actually hit the stage. I was brought on three years before the production to, to realise the animation of him in association with the technology that was required. Mm. So I, um, Sonny Tilders was the, the creature designer, fantastic um, designer. And my role was to bring him to life with 10 puppeteers we call King's Men. Mm, they were working and operating him. You saw King Kong. Uh, there was three voodoo operators. Um, the voodoo operators are like, I don't know best to describe it, like, like the, the, the guy behind the camera here. <laughs> uh, like he, that, they sat at the back of the auditorium and three puppeteers there on controls controlled 15 motors inside his head. Um, Outrageous. Or his shoulder lift, or his facial movements, or his wow, and his vocals, um, and his blinking, and his eyes. So the coordination of directing mm. fifth, uh, 13 direct puppeteers, um, a control for the, for the full kind of movement of him across the stage, because he weighed a ton. This is a long way from punch putting a dog through a laundromat thing, isn't it? <laughs> like that, the sophistication it was incredibly that sophisticated. has happened over the 45 years of your career. Look, it was, it was a remarkable, a rem Kong was remarkable. I mean, n nowhere in the history of, of the puppet theatre at all had been, something been created like this. Mm. It, did, it went to Broadway and played for a year. Mm. I had a, a, um, a very successful season over there. What else is happening with puppetry in Australia at the moment? And is it still vibrant and exciting? Hmm. I think um, your Congress in 2013-14. Hmm. There is puppetry, but I think one of, one of, there's a number of things that I think that require kind of a shift forward in the art form. There is a company called Blank Canvas here in Melbourne, and there are companies across the across Australia that, that are doing small works and are succeeding within their communities. But I actually think one of the things that's concerned me greatly over the last you know, 10 years is that the art form at a festival level doesn't get supported to the extent that I would like to see it. Supported financially or supported artistically with people wanting to do it or both? Both. Both. I think puppetry doesn't get the support that I think that it deserves. And what can puppetry tell in its storytelling that other art forms can't tell, that dance can't tell, that comedy can't tell, that opera can't tell, that theatre can't tell? It's uh, um, the, there is something deeply spiritual about the puppet. Um, it has, it deals from my viewpoint about the other. It can do things that Dance and drama and opera can't do. You can, you can animate things in a very different way. You can t take a character's head off and place it over here on the table. Uh, you can break a character apart. You can create um, huge scenes on stage where you can't afford necessarily to have you know, 200 people on stage, but you can create that through puppetry. You, you imbue, you actually create and set up a whole imaginative world through puppetry that I think is something that we all crave for. We all seek and search for the other. Uh, this, this whole sense, particularly through these last couple of years, we're all looking for something else. And the spirit, the spirit that sits within the animation and um, life that puppetry gives is, I think, something that we all delight in and pleasure in. And I, 
I want to see, yes, there's, yes, more money and festivals picking up more puppetry, but I think it also goes back to the artists about their ideas, about being able to bring to life their ideas and how best can we find an audience to tell our stories, celebrate how important this art form is, um, not only here within Australia, but on the, on the, on the global stage as well. Peter Wilson, thank you for chatting with us. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Libby. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome. <laughs>